Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning, good afternoon. Um, it's a pleasure to have you with us uh, for another great session during the virtual Ops 2020 season. Today, we selected a very important topic of air cargo and airline operations integration, and we could win a great guest speaker. Before we are introducing him to you, um, I suggest that we are starting with a short introduction round. Um, and before that, just give me some logistics information. So the session is recorded, will be published later on the event website. And the format of the Virtual Ops 2020 season is uh, quite similar to the Virtual Happy Hour uh, we are conducting since end of March. Uh, so we have a limited amount of attendees and every attendee is uh, heavily invited to speak up and ask questions during the presentation. So we really want to foster dialogue and the exchange of industry spec practice amongst all attendees. So now let's start with the introduction. Ladies first, let's go to Singapore, Yvonne. Hi, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Yvonne from uh, the IBS Software uh, Region Sales Team. Um, I actually started off my aviation career in uh, cargo, with Singapore Airlines Cargo. So this is always a topic that's, that's kind of close to my heart. So I'm uh, looking forward to the discussion today. Thanks. Then let's go to Taipei, the colleagues of China Airlines Cargo, if you can just give us a short introduction from everybody from Rukis. Taipei, I think you are muted. Okay, then oh. let's go from Taipei to uh, another Hi. Singapore guest. Ah, now we can hear you. Yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, hello, I'm Arthur. My colleague and I will join the meeting. Thank you for your time. Eugene, the stage is yours. Hi, I'm Eugene Lu. Um, I'm regional head for and Taiwan and Hong Kong. Um, I'm, I'm also coming from the aviation background in the IT solution, per se, um, for the past 20 over years. So I'm glad to be in this session and glad to have uh, China Airlines and other guests in this session. Let's go to Kuala Lumpur. Riza, if you can just introduce yourself shortly, please. Hi, everyone. Riza. Um, from flight operations. I look after uh, pilots and cabin crew man power planning and rostering. Pleasure to be here. Thank you. And when we are talking about Kuala Lumpur, of course, you're from Malaysia Airlines because there are other options too. Yes, thank you. I'm from Malaysia Airlines. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, uh, so Shield, if you can just uh, shortly introduce yourself, please. You are muted. So Shil, you are muted. We cannot hear you. Yeah. Yeah. Hello, I am Sushil. I have uh, shared a long uh, relationship with IBS when I was at Dinata, where we implemented the cargo so solutions. And uh, right now I'm uh, supporting Uganda Airlines in their digital transformation. We just completed the choice for the enterprise resource planning. Oracle and the BSS, which is Amadeus. And now we are looking at everything, which is the flight operations and the cargo solutions again. So I'm interested to hear what IBS is saying. Thank you. Let's go to Vinny. Then let's go to Marcos. Hey, good morning. Oh, good afternoon, Aaron. Can you hear me? Yes. We can hear you, Marcos. Okay, fantastic. That's very good. Um, I'm an independent uh, industry expert. Uh, I used to work for Lufthansa Cargo. I was responsible for the Traxon data messaging platform for many years. My latest assignment has been with the folks from Uniload Aviation Solutions, where we developed a digital transformation program for the introduction of Internet of Things into the sphere of ULD management. And I'm very curious, really, to see what's going to happen in this call today. Thank you. Let's go to Zurich now. Hartmut. A wonderful good morning and good afternoon to all directions. I'm Hartmut from IBS in Zurich. I'm taking care of sales activities in the, the DACH region, Southern Europe, Eastern Europe and Africa. And therefore, I'm delighted to see that many yeah, old and new faces today. 
Yeah, and I'm your host today. Um, I'm Daniel Stecher, based in, in Berlin. Uh, three and a half years uh, with uh, IBS now, Vice President Allen Operations. Uh, and I'm very much delighted that I could uh, win Christian Gessner as a guest speaker today. So Christian, the stage is yours and uh, please uh, start your presentation. Perhaps I introduce myself first because I feel myself a bit delighted. Um, I've been now 20, nearly 20 years in the industry and actually I started my career um, working for two carriers. One was a Taiwanese carrier, Eva Airways. So I'm also delighted to have colleagues from China Airlines here on the call. And um, the next step in my career was working for Malaysia Airlines. So I'm all, also happy um, to have somebody from Malaysia Airlines or my old colleagues, Mas Cargo, um, here on the call. Um, then I worked a long time for IATA, driving digital um, campaigns in the DAC region, um, digital transformation campaigns like eAvable, eFreight, etc. And then I stepped out of IATA and started my career working um, for um, IT service providers. Um, the, the steps include the Unisys um, Champ, and most recently I've joined IBS last year, where I'm responsible for the global sales of the iCargo solution portfolio. So I'm going to start my deck. So, building the bridge between air cargo and airline operations. Just have a look at these pictures. Most recently, we've seen a lot of activity with you to cargo due to COVID-19. And um, as you can see, um, a lot of passenger aircrafts have been turned into so-called freighters. Um, and I wanted to introduce how important actually flight ops and cargo is. As you can see on the left hand side, that's how you not should be doing it. On the right hand side, that's how it should be loaded. But this, of course, um, brought new challenges and ways of working actually to the business. So let's dive a bit into the topic itself. Um, what we are currently facing actually in the industry is um, um, the, the, the difference between um, the capacity growth and the demand on the market um, has gone um, outside. Um, we see a lot of demand actually coming, um, which is far higher than actually what, what capacity is being offered, but it's still under actually um, where it was the past few years. This of course has led to great advantages for a lot of carriers actually. And so cargo has developed actually to be the lifeline um, of you carriers at the moment. You earn a lot of money with cargo, the rates are quite up, but um, this graphic really shows the root cause of this. If we go further and just a few messages from the past few weeks and months, um, iCargo just completed a 100 cargo only flight to Johannesburg. American Airlines operated over 1000 cargo flights just in September. NAM Air Charter Service flew 20 charters to the UK flying um, COVID-19 equipment, masks, etc. Fly Dubai, who is actually an ACC carrier who just flies passengers, was flying a record of 21 tons on board of a 737-800 NG. Thus, Cargo has just um, basically extended their, their contract with Novo Nordisk, who is a pharma provider, um, to transport life-saving trucks. This will include also vaccines for COVID-19. Tiaka. Um, we all know this is um, an association in the air cargo area and pharma.aero, which is an association which is dedicated actually to the um, transport of pharma goods. Um, they have just um, prepared basically an initiative to drive COVID-19 vaccine transportation. Airbridge Cargo moved 30 tons of medicines from Amsterdam to Shanghai. Cargolox has flown 3.3 million doses of meningitis C vaccines to Brazil. LATAM delivers 3,200 tons of medical supplies from China to Brazil. LATAM completes delivery of 240 million masks to Brazil government and Emirates and just operated more than 7,600 flights in May and June, just flying cargo. The reason why I'm showing this actually is all of these news are basically or currently happening in cargo are all related actually to the current situation we are facing in the industry. COVID-19 is still everywhere present um, as respective equipment will be needed. And as soon as the vaccine is ready, it will be also will be transported. And these are all demands or basically um, 
needs of capacity on air cargo flights actually besides the actual real cargo world. So I would like to take you a bit into um, what actually cargo does. Um, but before of that, and before we start really diving into cargo, um, I would like to raise and emphasize actually the importance of technology. And that's what we're going to talk about today. You know, we have the different technologies. We have cargo um, IT platforms as well as basically flight ops platforms. And um, Daniel and I, and I'm delighted to have been invited to this call, we want to build a bridge actually with both two silos, which we see within an air carrier. So if you basically take um, how can technology basically advance and how the connection, that's what we're going to talk about between um, flight ops and air cargo solutions can be built. We think it will lead to generate long-term value with digital tools. It will increase efficiencies and cost savings. It can secure new revenue sources. And we are seeing this for carriers. I mean, looking at freighters, but also the transport of vaccines, etc. Pharma will become more important. E-commerce is another lifeline for cargo. And I will speak later more about that. But of course, when you fly certain commodities actually in the industry, they need a certain amount of quality and um, careness, actually, especially with vaccines. So also the risk management needs to be transformed. And all of this actually adds up into what we as IBS see as road to recovery for you, the carriers. So let's look at a day in air cargo. If you, if you have 24 hours in air cargo, what actually is happening? So um, we have different commodities, different things are flown, but air cargo really makes our world happen, happening. We've got over 80,000 flowers transported per day, 100,000 planes are taking off, 20 million e-commerce parcels are sent, 140,000 tons of cargo are carried. On a single day, and this is just all the different packages, 657 million packages worth 17.8 billion US dollars are moved. So what we are saying is actually air cargo is moving around really valuable goods. 80.6 billion value in air cargo shipped. Um, of course, um, consumer electronics is also a big portion of air cargo. So 1.1 million smartphones are transported. And here I can give an example. For example, when an iPhone um, is launched in Europe. Actually, you see a lot of freighters actually coming into Frankfurt, coming into Amsterdam, and the only thing they are carrying are basically iPhones. But also other commodities like racehorses, modern um, racehorses, polo wouldn't be possible without air freight actually. So over 200 racehorses are transported per day. We already talked about vaccines. We talk about medicaments, which need to be transported very quickly into regions where it's needed. Just thinking about Ebola in Africa, et cetera, um, 6,849 lives are saved per day, actually, just by air cargo. And we wouldn't imagine it, but um, still in the times of, of um, social media platforms, as well as, um, let's say, um, emails, um, nearly 900 million letters are sent. So that's basically what happens on a day of air cargo. These are really impressive figures, I, and I, I'm I'm remembering while I was working in the uh, cargo industry uh, some uh, years back. Um, I, of course, I, I uh, was um, knowing the importance of air cargo, but I think at least now during COVID-19 times, it's even more important because when I'm now considering how many people in lockdown situations had to order um, everything online and um, also um, how many um, people are potentially now um, safe because um, they, they got all the medicaments and the mask and so on also shipped. Uh, so I think the importance of cargo is uh, even more important than ever. Absolutely correct, Daniel. Thanks for mentioning this. But that's what I wanted to actually emphasize with this slide. I want to show that air cargo is really needed. And I was actually all, also surprised, actually, even during COVID-19, when I went to the supermarket, you know, and I, I go to the um, vegetables and fruit area, you still have mangoes basically coming from Pakistan. We just recently heard that um, several million of mangoes were flown by Emirates, etc. Et but that basically, we need to understand that air cargo really um, 
is the root cause why we have these, let's say, luxury goods all around, why we have um, e-commerce functioning around the globe and why we get actually the things we need for our daily life from all across the globe in the respective countries we live in. But also things like what I also would mention, I mean, you know, we are seeing um, if you are um, interested in Formula One and Malaysia Airlines might know this or Mars Cargo during my days at Mars Cargo, we also flew actually um, the racing cars. The possibility of the, the Formula One circus around the globe wouldn't be possible without air cargo. The cars need to be transported between the different locations all around the globe. So let's go on. So what are actually the priorities and um, with, with you to digital transformation and air cargo? And as we all know, IATA works heavily on this and has defined basically six key areas where you need to put your emphasis in driving digital transformation. As Daniel just mentioned, um, capitalizing on e-commerce plays an essential role actually for us. More and more shipments need to be moved around, warehouses need to be feeded, and you as a consumer want to know also um, where and when you, your parcel will arrive. So you, a certain transparency is needed. So that needs to actually be driven into our day-to-day -day operations at Air Cargo. To, to gain this transparency, actually, we need to move to um, data on demand. Restrictive data needs to be exchanged between the different players in the supply chain. And as you all know, you're all working for carriers, of course, in, in the flight ops area. But if you look at cargo and how it's being delivered, you have between eight to 12 players actually involved in, in from, a sh from a consignee um, to a destination, how much basically um, data and different systems need to talk to each other. So having this um, data on demand, knowing what's actually happening with the cargo on, on, on these different stations, it's tech, you can develop real-time interaction. As you might know, you, you will know actually if a battery needs to be recharged, what is actually ha happening with the cargo? Has it been loaded on the aircraft? And in your case, if you do a tail change, for example, reducing the aircraft um, to a smaller equipment from a wide body to a narrow body. Do you actually know what's happening on the tour line, etc.? So this all moving data on demand, developing real-time interaction, if you take this into account, this really starts then making quality relevant. And I will speak a bit more detailed about this, but there's an initiative in, in, um, in Air Cargo called Cargo IQ, which is basically um, a quality management methodology which defines certain KPIs or milestones across the supply chain on the air cargo supply chain. And these milestones need to be reached. And as soon as you guys and operations actually change in equipment, certain milestones might not be reached. So to make quality relevant, actually, systems need to talk to each other, exchange, so you can take an active approach, actually, to, to um, quality and not only reactive. And this leads basically to the fact as soon as you get really active um, working on the quality, you can optimize the end-to-end -end journey. When you, when you know what's happening, what's going wrong on different trade lanes, when you know how where certain stations have more disruptions than others, where more tail, tail changes, et cetera, happening, or where you even have difficulties with crews, basically, getting on the aircraft, you can use this data and optimize your end-to-end -end journey. And last but not least, and I'm really delighted to have Camilo Garcia from Web Cargo on board. Of course, you also need cargo. You need to modernize the way you distribute, distribute cargo to your clients. You want to sell your products. You want to bring them to market very quick. And you want to bring also the information of your shipments um, very quickly um, to there. So um, Camilo, feel free if you want to talk a bit about modernizing cargo distribution. Here's, here's the panel to do so. Camilo? Okay, then we move on. Um, but, but maybe, Christian, I can just jump in because I think you made a very valid point about the connectivity of different operational systems, really, and, and planning tools that are in place. And just a, probably a story from real life experience. I worked for many, many years for a cargo carrier, and we had tremendous quality issues with offloads, freight being bumped on destinations to the Ivory Coast, to Lagos, and those areas. And we were wondering why that was happening. And it was really funny because we were starting our pre-booking process with our capacity planning. They were all confirmed. 
And every single week again, the freight and the cargo was bumped off the flight until we realized what was actually happening. We were bumped off because of excess luggage coming actually from the passenger side of the business from Shanghai, going via Frankfurt all the way to the Ivory Coast. So what was happening? <laughs> At the time, the Ivory Coast had actually sort of like banned the import of textiles in order to protect their own textile industry. So smart businessmen had designed a way to bypass that system by actually sending buyers to China directly, buying the textiles in China, and then actually on, on regular passenger tickets, booking that and loading that on aircraft as excess individual luggage, which always has priority over cargo. So, but you can see, it was very interesting for us that our cargo department and capacity planning didn't know what was happening on the passenger side. And hence, this is why it is so important that, you know, the two operational systems can talk to each other and that that information is exchanged and we don't create service issues over and over again. And it takes weeks actually to conclude what was happening and how to manage that. Yeah. So, but, uh, but how, did, how did you basically come across this? I mean, you, you just said that it basically took weeks um, to find out what was happening. I mean, was it by accident or did you call the flight ops guy? How, how did you get this information finally, actually? Or did you go out to the aircraft? And well, we, we, it, it was really done in, in the old way by, by calling through and dialing and talking to, through different departments, really. I mean, it started a lot because we had furious, you know, forwarders on, on one end of the telephone line com complaining why their cargo has been bumped again. And then you talk to our capacity management guys within the carrier and they say, look, everything is fine. We plan this every week. We don't know what's happening. It's always, you know, there's always sufficient capacity. We can see what has been pre-planned in terms of luggage yieldies. Um, but in the end, what no one realized is really we should have checked actually how, man, how many transit, you know, tickets were booked coming from Shanghai going all the way to Lagos or other destinations along the Ivory Coast. And to my surprise, really, I, I, and I learned it only then, that two planning systems were not connected with each other. And that is something that shouldn't happen. And it really, to answer your question, it was done by, you know, making phone calls, talking to people, understanding really who is responsible for which part, really, and which which line of the business is a passenger responsibility, cargo responsibility. Um, but this could have been resolved a lot quicker if the systems would have been connected to each other and you could have basically calibrated the way how you do the planning together. Yeah. So would you say that basically this reflects a bit the silo situation within the carriers that the different departments, I mean, I know which carrier you are meaning and I know that it's even different, different entities, Lufthansa Cargo and Lufthansa as such are different companies and basically Lufthansa Cargo buys the capacity of Lufthansa. But how, how would you see, how could this improve if when the systems would be really talking? I mean, we are talking now about manual processes, picking up the phone, even sending emails, etc. But how would you perceive this? How could this be be uh, be improved when the systems would be talking to each other via APIs or etc. I mean, I will get to all of these topics actually. But yeah, you can I, do I this via APIs, but but first of all, you need to really look at the. I mean, if you want to want to start right at the, at the at the first point of where the data becomes available is really when you look up of, of ticket pre bookings really, and you realize there's a sudden increase of transit you know, tickets being booked from Shanghai via Frankfurt to Lagos. If you have that situation, you can actually start predicting there are certain patterns that repeat themselves. And once you have, uh, or the system identifies that pattern, you can pass that on into the cargo planning where you know, okay, if I have that amount of tickets going on transit to the Ivory Coast coming from China, it's very important really to reduce the, the cargo capacity on the flight and not to plan with, let's say, the 100% availability for cargo on that specific flight. Um, and that is very important, I think, now more than ever, and hopefully this is one of the outcomes really of, of, of the current situation, is that we consider airline operations as a holistic exercise and not done by departmental functions. So the cargo guys do their cargo planning only, and then I act very surprised if they see suddenly excess luggage popping up all over the place. So that needs to be looked at from one system or minimum by two systems that can exchange information and send alerts and that type of, of information. I would even say it's three systems because first of all, it's you need you need to um, identify the booking patterns. So that would, would come from the reservations or passenger side. Yeah. Then you have to take certain measurements with you to the equipment and baggage load, etc. So that would be flight ops. And then finally, cargo needs to react to it. Maybe rebook um, um, the freight or even need to um, see if, if other trade lanes or the um, possibilities in the network can be used to actually move the needed cargo around. Mm -hmm. 
But thank you for this val valid point. And I actually wanted to dive deeper into these topics a bit later so we can come back to this. But um, to drive these digital um, focus areas, uh, sorry, to drive these digital um, improvements for the digital transformation, um, we at IBS have identified certain innovation focus areas. First of all, um, when you have integrated systems, or like just uh, Marcus just mentioned, if you have systems which talk to each other, you get availability of data, and data can be used. And therefore, that's when, when actually the beauty starts, you can start with real-time analytics. And this will lead to an integrated decision support using historical data, and you just set you just talked about patterns, Marcos. You can do pattern matching, and based on them, that will drive actually your decisions, and that can also drive your decisions actually in the flight ops department if you decide due to a, a lower passenger load actually to change the equipment. But you still will have cargo on board, so all these systems need to talk with each other. All this data needs to be collated in big data pools, and then you can drive it with real-time analytics. Of course, user experience also plays a major role. How do I, I'm as a user in the active operations, in the day-to-day -day operations, actually can drive basically um, these things? I need a system which basically shows me this information in a visual way that I can digest it and take the decisions. So the user experience should be intuitive, easy to learn, and a design to um, support multiple devices. So not only, um, and we've seen this actually now in the industry, we all have to work remote. We all have to work from different systems. And Daniel, you can correct me and you're wrong. In a lot of OCCs, basically, you have to work with several different systems. And this is my questions I, I want to ask to you, Daniel, actually. How do you perceive this in a way um, when you have four or five different systems? systems you have to work with in an OCC actually do your day-to-day -day business. How can you transport that to home? I mean, I, we all have just one computer or two computers and we've got one telephone, but how 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 would you see receive this actually working from home in such an environment? I think that's exactly uh, the bottleneck. So um, that's why also some airlines are uh, not able to let their staff uh, remotely control or crew tracking um, and then they have to uh, organize maybe different teams in order to meet also the requirements of physical distance and, and all the um, health uh, care requirements. Um, and I think that's exactly the opportunity now for airlines to consider uh, what uh, is necessary to make a business transformation to prepare for the next crisis because COVID-19 is one crisis and you can expect uh, other crises coming in the future and I think airlines can now um, have the learnings out of the current situation um, and they have also opportunities because if you let your staff work from home you can maybe also consider to give up costly headquarters, costly operations control center, and you can also positively influence the work-life balance um, of your staff. And uh, you can also mitigate the, the time um, necessary to commute. So there are a lot of opportunities, not just risk. Um, and uh, talking with the industry, some of the airlines are exactly looking into these um, opportunities um, in order to save costs, but also transforming their business and bring exactly the cargo and the airline operations much tighter together because they have uh, suddenly seen that they can also uh, have a good uh, revenue out of this cargo business. Good to say. And I think another aspect is actually if you work remote and you have remote teams which work together, you need a seamless um, connectivity and, and collaboration needs to be supported. And with, with, with you to cargo, I mean, it's not only as an airline as such and shouldn't shouldn't be seen individually. We are seeing more and more actually um, joint ventures emerging. Actually, we've got um, troops like Sky Cargo who heavily, heavily, heavily work together. I mean, I think China Airlines is a part of that. And you guys can can might um, um, tell us something about that. I don't know you are from cargo but i think you heavily uh, work closely together with with the sky team partners actually like korean um delta air france klm in the respective countries but collaboration in, in some some thought can only work with seamless connectivity not only intern with an airline and we just heard from marcos the systems need to be um connected but it's also about what data needs to be shared between the different par partners and what data you have 
And with you to cargo and with you to the commodities and looking at what, what will happen in the future actually with the vaccines to be transported and we are seeing actually the industry currently preparing for this, smart wired will become um, a real, real um, point actually. Intelligent containers and the connectivity actually to, um, to respective uh, systems. So since we have Marcos on the call, and I know you developed and you got an innovation award actually for that from IATA. Can you can you elaborate a bit how how an intelligent container can communicate with a cargo system and this data can also be used for flight ops? What? Mm. Uh, I'm happy to do that question. I'm not sure how familiar you guys are with the management of ULDs, but let's put it this way. A ULD is really a dump um, aluminium can really, that's what it is. And normally what happens if you have a smart ULD in, in this day and age, it has, a, um, it has a, a QR code on the side that can be scanned. But uh, that being said, normally you have you know, ULDs being prepared on the apron uh, at, the, at the loading position for the aircraft. It's a dump unit that just sits there in case of an offload, it stays on the position. And normally what happens if you will only realize that a offload has happened, if that unit is being returned into the warehouse on the cargo side and it's being scanned back into the system in the warehouse. This is not happening on the apron side. So what we were developing at the time at Unilad Aviation Solutions was actually a device that allows us to connect these units via a, um, a GPS sensor or a Bluetooth sensor inside the ULD really to provide real-time information, A, about its whereabouts, and B, to connect it through a network that allows really to track and trace it along the airport and also to have the possibility to track it when it's being tracked into warehouses or forwarders and also to install these type of readers really into the storage facilities of ULDs, providing you with immediate information how many units are available for loading, which is important really when you think about that very often one of the shortcomings in cargo operations is that load devices are missing because no one knows how many are actually stored in a warehouse. So this is one of the things. If you take it one step further, um, the solution created was also possible to provide a service really to the passenger side of business. You could now match actually the ULD ID number with a ticket number, for example, or the luggage number that you have on a, on a, on a ticket tag. Um, and then create a situation where you would be in compliance with the IATA resolution that has defined certain milestones to be monitored on the baggage journey. I think it's IATA resolution 753, if I'm not completely wrong, which will be implemented, I think, over the next two years. So if you have now a device where you can synchronize the data of your luggage tag with that of the of the ULD, you would have instantaneously information on the on the real-time whereabouts of a unit and the luggage piece around the airport. Um, without having a lot of luggage. manual or physical things to do, yeah. But it wouldn't be only only related to luggage. I'm just envisioning. I mean, if you have an equipment mm -hmm. you're downsizing, basically, and then the respective message, type B message, goes then uh, to the cargo system. What's actually happening with the cargo or that um, UAD on the turmoil? I mean, something needs to work. And if you are telling me that basically. Mm -hmm. um, only the warehouse has this function at the moment to scan, et cetera. Um, for me, this is a bottleneck. I mean, really. It, it, it is a bottleneck. And technically, when you look, look forward, I mean, what should happen is actually, and, and that is the very important thing, really. Um, if you have now a system in place that allows you to scan and monitor the apron side and the tarmac really and permanently, you would get instantaneous information about, okay, this unit has been planned on the flight and it's still sitting there 10 minutes after the flight has departed and that information has been related back into the system. So what you could think about is now in actual fact, the situation where the container alert is being raised immediately and that replanning process starts, let's say at least an hour earlier than it currently is being done. So of course, I'll take that with a bit of a pinch of salt because we live in a very um, diverse environment. We have some airports and carriers that are better organized from an operational point of view where that may happen a lot earlier. But in, in general, I would say this is one of the bottlenecks that we have in the industry that the replanning starts at a very late stage, uh, exactly at the point when the ground handler, you know, does the, the, the checks of what has been loaded and hasn't been loaded and the, and the units are being transported back into, into uh, the warehouse. So that is something um, that Uniload has been working heavily on and, and we're currently, or the, the company is currently rolling out all the reader network with the ground handlers. So you will be seeing that's happening. Um, 
and and that should allow for a massive improvement in terms of quality and utilization of capacity. I mean, I I know from carriers that had to allow freighter aircrafts to leave airports half empty with only half the payload they could have carried because the forwarders didn't have load devices to deliver cargo to them. So imagine just not the annoyance on the forwarder side, but also the loss of revenue and the impact we have on the environment by flying, you know, half empty aircraft around the world. That is not very sustainable. So oh, we, what, what, what we're aiming at is really to have a smart container that becomes um, so smart that it can raise alerts by itself, that can raise alerts when it's been damaged, when it needs to go into maintenance. That type of thing is really, I think, what, what the industry is looking for. And you could even take it one step further. You could think about those ULDs becoming a shared part of the infrastructure where you create models on a pay-per-use basis where you just pick up any can that's out there, fill it with luggage or container or, or cargo and return it to the airport system at the airport of destination. So this is, of course, all futuristic. And the sharing of the load devices is um, practiced by a few carriers at the moment. But when you think about it, it would overcome a lot of problems that we have in this industry in terms of positioning flights, carrying empty, empty positions and that type of thing. How I mean, would this work then with all the cargo, which is currently, for example, on passenger um, airplane and within the cabin, where you are not using containers and you just have these nets uh, surrounded on on the uh, shipments put in the cabin? Yeah, that's um, that, that, that's a smart thing. The device that uh, has been designed together with uh, on asset, it's an American company. It's a small Bluetooth device. It has the size of a of a matchbox, really. It's very inexpensive, so technically speaking, you could put that also in a in a cardboard box that you have um, on 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 a seat or however you organize that really on on the main deck in a in a converted passenger aircraft. So that's technically possible, and the reader is actually it's relatively inexpensive because it's simple Bluetooth technology. So you would not necessarily need to introduce like a a hardware on board of the aircraft, but you would just need to equip the flight attendants with a with a modern smartphone that has Bluetooth 5 capability, and you would be able to transmit that information also from the passenger main deck, really. So it's a smart, easy to introduce, very cost efficient situation. The majority of modern aircrafts on intercon flights these days have a connectivity to the internet, and that's what you could do with the smartphone. So you could relay back that information. Yeah. I mean, that's the beauty of I IoT, basically, but it's not only Bluetooth. I mean, there are also other providers on in the industry which have devices yeah. which can connect, for example, via the wireless LAN on an aircraft actually with the internet and therefore um, collate actually data into different systems. And we at IBS have already picked this up. So our iCargo platform has full connectivity uh, capabilities like products like OnAsset or Zendum is another provider. So there are different providers on the industry. But again, this information is, of course, key. But that's why we are emphasizing on this call, actually. I think also this information somehow needs to get actually in the OCCs and drive their decision making, or at least um, um, based on their decisions, actually, the cargo system or the people in cargo re really need to know their activities. I mean, and we are talking now about UEDs, etc., but we should also talk about the content of UEDs. Let's mm. look at vaccines, for example. You know, I'm, I'm just looking, we have somebody from Uganda Airways. I don't know how, how hot it can get in Africa on the turmoil, 50 degrees, etc. And um, I can recall a story we had on the virtual happy hour where, where an aircraft was grounded, um, which had uh, several tons of red wine on board, basically, and these bottles were broken and everything, and the, the plane couldn't be couldn't move actually and, and of course with the heat in south africa what evolves it that but that's what, how i see i mean um an, an, an active cooling device where a certain temperature um area is not allowed to breach and it perhaps for example just has, has a cooling blanket on there i think that won't be sufficient so it has to really be quickly um pulled out of the turmoil back into the warehouse back into the pharma um, areas of the warehouse, etc., so till it goes to the next flight or even be moved quickly on the next flight where it can fly to. Um, but, if but you take maybe Chris, so just to jump jump in there, just quickly one, one, one thought really. I think the topic that we're talking about here is really the topic about the facilitation of data exchange. And I think that is the topic of our day and age in really in, in the IT environment to secure that whatever devices and systems we are using, that we always bear in mind 
that these systems need to talk to each other. And that's very important to bear that in mind when you start your planning, really. And so the meta topic from my point of view really is currently not so much whether you use, you know, a certain text standard or a certain message type or whatever you want to use. I think from my point of view, the meta topic is really you need to secure that your data can be exchanged and is legible by other systems. That's the most important part. Now you have basically come to already to the outcome of my presentation. Oh, sorry, so the, apologies for that question. <laughs> currently, the data exchange basically happens via type B messaging or um, yeah. In, in, in basic, in the best case, an FFM, which um, is exchanged with the op system. Um, so you know what, what load is on the aircraft, but you, you really got the point and you pointed it out. We really need to think about what data needs to be exchanged. What are the means of exchanging this data and to build basically a smart environment. And but not but exchange. I think the limitation is very often that many of the airlines out there are still using mainframe legacy technology. And that's Absolutely. why it's very difficult to get the big data uh, information in all these restricted uh, backbones. Um, and then you try to circumvent it and to find um, workarounds to get the data. And that's my understanding why all these capabilities of having the data and making use of it are not really uh, used on a daily basis for better decision making. So I think um, the root cause is renovate uh, the cellar of your house and then build up all the other um, um, flaws and not just put a nice um, roof on top of your very old um, um, building because that's not really helping you to take better decisions. Absolutely. We need to rethink as, the way we are doing business and how systems talk to each other. But as we has a, have a, a big, a quite big uh, African audience today, of course, I'm quite keen to, to have their their say and uh, maybe they can share us their experiences. So we have minimum one uh, airline, which is Uganda Airlines and uh, a ground handling company from Kenya. Is, is there anything you'd like to add on this on this discussion? I think Derek is on mute. I think oh, now he's on, on talk now. I, I'm sorry. I'm I'm just seeing my presentation. Yes. So I ask you to basically moderate. I I don't see if the speaker raises the hands. Uh, hello. We are just taking notes. Uh, uh, good morning, all. We're just taking some notes, and we thought we would ask our questions. Go uh, ahead. Probably later towards towards the end of the session. So. Okay. or maybe questions of a, or any additions because most of what we are doing right now is to set up all our cargo and ground handling okay um so that so we are trying to get as much ideas as possible to have it operate as seamlessly as possible and feel free um with this presentations my contact details will be shared Daniel's contact details and we are really open if we can support you on on these assessments and you want to generate some outcomes we are more than um, open to discuss this with you and give you de deeper insight actually into product capabilities and how we see this can be true well anyhow um, oh, I would li like okay, to get this is noted to thank you um, I would like to go to the next point um, art artificial and automation Everything somehow comes together, what I just said, real-time analytics, user experience, collaboration. But of course, you know, you want, we have a lot of repetitive tasks actually taking place in our day-to-day -day work. And especially me coming from cargo, having on the old days, um, typing Zeta, uh, sorry, um, telex messages, etc. I mean, this is the old world. So in the new world, having this all together, we can automate these repetitive tasks. We can basically drive efficiencies and this will also lead to more quality because we can reduce human errors. An intelligence system then basically can talk to you yeah, using artificial intelligence and even inform you, hey, your decision might not be right because you've decided actually in the past differently, etc. So artificial intelligence and automation will bring another benefit. So if you translate all of these things actually into a modern cargo system, I come to my next slide. So transforming these innovation areas into functionality, these are basically the six main points we see in a modern air cargo systems need to facilitate, also with view to the connectivity to flight ops. 
So it should be a unified platform for and work processes. So you as carriers, we have big networks, you've got a lot of stations, but you need somehow a cross stational work process baselining, a standard all across your operations. Of course, different stations have different requirements. You've got embargoes, et cetera, so, um, or different ways of works or even different capabilities. Different stations have different um, equipment. And this is something you also need to consider to flight ops. You might change um, the destination or you might divert an aircraft to another station. With you to cargo, you need to understand what are the station capabilities? Do they have the, the load devices I need? Do they do, Does the warehouse have, have a cooling um, area, etc.? All of these things also need to be considered. So station-specific exceptions and variances are needed. And, and the system itself, we are all faced in an industry which is very volatile. It changes constantly, demand changes, but not only demand, also the regulatory requirements, compliance plays a major role. So you need a high level of configurability in the system. We just talked about connectivity and, and uh, exchanging data. So digital channels really play a major role. It's not only about customer facing platforms, which are the true source of data. And we're seeing initiatives like one record from IATA. There should be a one-time capture and everybody else will use this data um, later. And when you when you use all of these digital channels and exchange the re, um, respective data, you will have rich ancillary data collection also supporting this. So altogether, a rich data repository of data um, brings the real benefits. A broader data um, funnel, you need a rich data platform to support business intelligence and reporting. All decision making is basically based on reports. So you need um, visualization of data, etc. Integrated system controls and privileges based on accesses. So different people working um, in different parts of your operation need to have different accesses. Um, an easy consolidation and visualization of business data needs to happen. And that, of course, if you want to drive an active approach to quality, you need an easy monitoring of your KPIs you have in your um, operation. Smart warehouses. We just spoke about this actually with Marcos. SLA driven task planning and allocation. You've outsourced all around the globe basically your ground handling to other companies. So you somehow need also a real time monitoring and exception handling. You need a proactive issue identification and advanced handling capabilities. Cargo is moving from general cargo. We are flying e commerce, which has a certain demand on transparency. Where's the shipment? down um, the supply chain, or you're flying different commodities. We're talking about Africa, Kenya, for example. All of the roses I buy are actually here in a restaurant when a guy runs around, has a rose, um, and I have a beautiful girl, girl sitting in front of me and I want to give her her rose, are all coming from Kenya. Advanced handling capabilities, improved customer experience, um, also when it gets to the de delivery into the warehouse. And something which is really interesting actually is, you know, um, Due to COVID-19, we wanted to actually reduce the personal interaction. So in a smart warehouse, when you use our, all this functionality, um, you can have fully automized kiosks where the personal interaction is fully mitigated. Automated workflows, I already spoke about this. So the system should drive basically the workflows into your different warehouses. Automation for redundant tasks, reduced overhead of menu data entry. So um, reduce supervisory overheads. All of this will lead actually to, to, to um, more quality in, in your operation. And we all know this, everything we do in an airline is basically process driven. We have our processes which are defined by standards, which are defined by um, requirements um, coming from the commodity or coming from regulatory um, um, rules, etc. So steering the handling process based on shipment characteristics is really key. And you should have a lower dependency on user recall and higher regulatory compliance. That's anyway part of our business in all means. If it's flight ops, if it's cargo, it's the passenger side, we are all have to comply with um, the, the what comes from the ICAO or from the respective regulatory entities in our respective countries. 
And um, what we are also seeing actually in the, in the industry is actually we see a lot of um, recurring people um, don't stay long with the company. The actually workforce is changing. It's being outsourced. So what we need to have in a system is a shorter learning curve for users. So that's how we perceive actually how um, an air cargo system looks like. And we talked about a few user cases, etc. But what, what I want to basically emphasize is this is, is the cargo landscape. These are the entities which are involved. So we've got shippers um, who basically are the clients. We've got the forwarders who act as agents. They are the primary customers actually for us, the carriers. Then we've got the carrier itself who's flying the cargo. And most of carriers have outsourced all of their ground handling activities. I know two examples of carriers who don't even own their own ground handling anymore. Scandinavian Airlines, they have their own entity, Spirit, which does all the ground handling on, on the Northern station, uh, Northern Europe stations, but also across the globe. It's always for a carrier, different companies working on your behalf. Then of course the airport is involved. It provides physical infrastructure or including also the warehouses, your cargo is being moved through. And then finally the consignee. And on top of it, we also have to deal with regulatory bodies. Since the Yemen incident, we need to exchange a lot of data actually with import customs entities, with import custom systems. But what happens actually, and this is actually what we are talking about today, and we already did, what happens with the digital landscape within a carrier? And now I would like to take again the example what Marcos told us in the beginning, actually, you know, you need to have different entities um, within an airline which talk to each other, which exchange data, and we need to get rid of actually the silo situation of these departments. So I want to come back actually to these digital transformation um, priorities, capitalizing on on e-commerce. I mean, I, if on a one day, 20 million passes are sent, um, you need to consider one thing. E-commerce shipments are always time definite. Let you as a customer, if you order something, one of the key things, and if I go to Amazon and I'm a prime client, yeah, Amazon tells me I will have my parcel on the next day. They even already tell me what delivery time. So if you put this in the context actually of, of air freight or the way we are operating, yeah, this has a certain impact. I mean, we can't delay cargo and e-commerce shipments not. Um, and further than that, the clients expect full transparency. So my question now to you guys working in operations, when you do a decision on a tail change, do you know how many of these e-commerce shipments are on board? Perhaps on a flight, you have a parcel. Actually, your auntie is expecting somewhere on the other side of the globe, your family or friends, etc. So my questions go out, actually, and I want to ask you this. You, you guys working in operations, do you actually know what is really in the aircraft below? Yeah, and there is a lot of paper-based um, information. So uh, there are some information there, but you were mentioning earlier that uh, the, the people in the OCC are sitting in front of multiple I IT systems and screens and they are not integrated with each other, which is one of the reasons that the decision making is pretty slow, is very reactive. Um, and that's why the industry needs to think more proactive, um, provide situation awareness to their people on the ground and they need to know um, is there a valuable cargo on board, is there an e-commerce shipment, is there a certain um, customer commitment uh, on board um, and not at the end explain, ah, we haven't seen this and we have offloaded it uh, and we didn't know because there are a lot of explanations why uh, I think we need to uh, put an infrastructure in place which is exactly avoiding this um, in the future and the, the good news is that um, IBS is exactly going this path and is currently transforming uh, the airline operations business and also um, uh, for airlines uh, having a lot of cargo business at the moment uh, and these airlines will be potentially the role model for the entire industry. Well, my question is, I mean, you, you, or you, Daniel, I, it goes out to you. Basically, um, in an OCC, don't you have passenger-related information? You know that you have a frequent flyer on board. You know how many first-class passengers, um, business class, etc., and you know what impact it would have, wouldn't it? 
Exactly. So the focus is primarily on, on passenger. Uh, I remember when I was working from 2002 to 2008 uh, in the cargo business, uh, selling a cargo handling system. Uh, cargo was always perceived as the black sheep in the family of the airline operations. And um, that's maybe one of the reasons why the e-commerce is very strong from the um, from the integrators who really cover the entire supply chain and some airlines of course have open cargo business but cargo was never perceived as sexy and uh, the passenger business was uh, perceived as the more sexy business i think um, that will change now also um, i think with the, the very good uh, revenues currently also passenger airlines can do with cargo in this crisis situation and also knowing that there is now the capability to integrate all these big data which is out there everybody is wearing a smartphone um, i was uh, i was always uh, surprised that in the year 2008 people were asking me do you support cargo 2000 so i think the industry was always trailing behind and now with a smartphone availability almost everywhere i think there is no excuse anymore to not use the data um, and um, so bringing really also the cargo perspective more prominently in the OCC and show, okay, this is a VIP cargo, this is a business cargo, and then also give uh, decision alternatives, what are the costs by offloading um, this cargo and um, maybe carry on the baggage of an uh, economy flying passenger. I think these trade-off information are now available and then uh, airlines will take better decisions, which are not always um, in favor of the passenger, but maybe more in favor also for the cargo because it is the high revenue um, in the future too. And as I know, I think in iFlight Neo, we already have this possibility to show this respected data, don't we? Exactly. So we, we provide transparency um, to the OCC um, and also with the integration to our iCargo platform. Um, uh, transparency is all about and also providing the transparency in, in the hub, for example, showing exactly the uh, cargo connection um, requirements and also helping um, exactly the, the load um, if you make a tail change and that you can really prioritize the relevant cargo in a, in a situation where you have to maybe downgrade from a white body to a narrow body but you know exactly this is a must-have on board cargo uh, with the information um, from the cargo system but i will get to that i mean you just need to recall all of this what we just said i mean an e-commerce shipment is always time definite and there's another th um, thing to it um, and Daniel just mentioned this. Integrators are really capable because basically they have an integrated supply chain. They control um, from shipper to consignee, basically the full supply chain. But honestly, with the, today's technology, actually carriers can become virtual integrators. You just need to see that you have a full connectivity with all the different um, um, service providers you have in your supply chain and the systems talk to each other. But I just wanted to give an example. I mean, how would you perceive it if you look in the internet, you put in your code actually, where's my shipment? And you see, uh, well, it will be delayed um, by a day because it's been offloaded off the aircraft because of an insufficient passenger load. It was a narrow body. I mean, it's unbelievable. The impact, you would never ever do this. So actually, and, and these things are need to be considered. And if, if airlines are picking up actually on e-commerce in the future, yeah, I mean, you, you might have, and you and Ops just see, oh, I've got four, a load of four pallets actually. But these four PMCs actually weighing each um, around 1,650 kilograms, just recall how much, how much a laptop, for example, weighs, two, five, three kilograms. So how many laptops, how many different e-commerce shipments could be on this one pallet you are offloading? So it would be, I mean, if, if, if you take, for example, three or four PMCs, which are in a triple seven, oh, can even take more, but I'm taking four as an example. Um, and you've got all of this cargo on board and the aircraft itself has 200, 300 passengers. They may be affected, but from a cargo perspective, it can even be more even be more clients who are affected actually by this decision. And I think maybe Christian, Christian, just one thought, if I just jump yeah. in there, if you don't mind. Yeah, I think I think what is important is that a lot of the carriers out there will be working 
in, in in collaborate with e-commerce providers like the likes of Alibaba and Amazon. And I think what is important, you need to develop that capability to have access and provide access to the data in order to become a relevant partner for those corporations. If not, you will be out of the game. What they will not accept is sort of like poor service delivery on part of the carrier that acts on their behalf. Um, and that is something we see already. I think part of the reason why the likes of Amazon is creating their own logistics system now with aircrafts, um, last mile delivery, etc., has to do with the fact that they do not trust really their partners to provide the service the customers have um, gotten used to over time. And I think hence, this is key if you want to play a role in the future of e-commerce distribution, specifically if you are a carrier that has a large, let's say, regional network and provides, um, you know, like the likes of, you know, European carriers where you have a lot of European flights, where you're an ideal partner for the delivery of smaller allotments into various countries. If you do not provide the reliability these carriers are used to, you will not be part of their partner network. So hence, you need to get this on board and implement it. I mean, absolutely what you're saying, Marcus, is right. And the beauty, I mean, full cargo carriers, Cargolux, for example, Polar, Amerijet, they won't have an issue with that. They understand um, that you need a digital landscape and they can partner with, with Amazon or Alibaba. But the beauty of, of us, the network carriers, and I perceive this as us, are the, the various destinations. You can take cargo all around um, the globe. I mean, Camillo, we know at IAG how many destinations actually British Airways had together with with um, with Iberia. And this is the benefit. And actually, e-commerce could leverage this, but it will only be capable of lever leveraging this, as Marcus just said, if we take respective measurements and systems talk to each other, we can exchange the data and we optimize the way we work. But also, my question also goes out to the audience. Can, can you request the respective data on the cargo you have on the individual flight? Daniel and I know this. I mean, basically, all, all you're getting is an FFM, a freight forward message, which shows the pallet, perhaps high level, high level commodities. But what kind of vaccines do I have on board? There are certain medicaments. You can't believe how valuable they are. There are certain um, cancer medicaments, which are very light and temperature sensitive. Just one, one, um, how do you so say it? Um, one, one, one um, usage part of it, one, one um, tablet is worth 50,000 euros. I mean, the, the value of this is amazing. So you need to mitigate also the risk. If in Uganda, for example, I mean, it, it stands for an hour on the turmoil um, by 50 degrees, it could kill it. And also talking about live animals, I mean, the passengers also are flying their dogs and these are transported and a lot of cargo departments see to this and, 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 and have to deal with it. But what happens if you offload um, a dog which is sitting in his, in his cage yeah, he needs to have, they are given certain medicaments sometimes, so they are, they calm down. If this isn't dealt with, he needs to have water. I mean, he wants water, he even wants food. So something needs to be dealt with, and this information needs to be exchanged. Same with perishables. I mean, a lot of the carriers are flying fish, flowers, fruits, and I spoke about this in the beginning. I mean, this is all, also always part of our daily life, and this needs to be dealt with. And this is what Daniel says, this information is actually needed um, when you take active decision when it gets to your aircraft. And priorities is also another role. Express, is it a top client? I mean, it could be that Pallet is, is my top client. He paid a lot of money because it's rev, um, Express. And it could also mean if I don't get it on that flight, that is actually the revenue which is missing for the flight. So you, you reduce basically um, your equipment to a narrow body because the passenger load is not sufficient. You want to save cost, but you offload a lot of cargo and that money you will also lose. I mean, you will fly it with another flight and I'm, I'm, I'm overdoing this a bit, but um, there could be because it's an express shipment. There could be certain liabilities um, and there are certain KPIs flown as booked, for example, and he might not even pay the cargo because it wasn't flown as booked. So all of these things needs to be considered. So taking this into account, and this question goes to the audience or Daniel, um, 
how how would you think would this affect your decision actually taken when 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 you think about changing a plan where well, the entire industry is pretty much list uh, based and uh, list oriented um, and meeting with airlines people always ask uh, can i get a suggestion from the system and that's exactly uh, what we're doing so uh, of course you have to consider before you get a value-based decision making or value-based suggestion system okay what is for me really number one priority number two priority number three priority and so on and so on um, and then a, a good digital platform can of course um, provide you and Uh, a list of action items uh, you need to consider and then at the end of the list you are maybe cutting off if the capacity is not there um, but that's what we are doing um, and uh, many airlines want to exactly go this direction having the data um, thinking about what is necessary which a decision have to be considered also which operational criteria have to be uh, considered uh, but currently um, the people are somehow lost in information They're not well equipped with the uh, infrastructure sitting in front of outdated technology. They do their very best. Uh, so sometimes the airlines are leaving alone the people in the fog, and uh, that's something which uh, I like very much the comment from uh, Marcus who said if you want to be a uh, partner for the industry in the future, you have to consider certain new trends and uh, technologies in order to be. I recognize as a partner for them to be part of their business and I think that's exactly how airlines have to see it and we also require a new mindset in the industry um, which goes uh, hopefully in the brighter futures. I mean we can even take it further what you just said Daniel this will um, basically uh, make the difference between the carriers which will survive and the carriers which won't. So um, Developing real-time interaction. We already talked about a bit about the impacts, basically what is happening on the turmoil. Um, if a new tail assignment takes place, how is the cargo department informed? If we look at this, it's just a message which goes to the system. So um, a modern cargo IT system, IBS, this will have um, basically an alarm and um, we also manage all the different shipments. Um, we have clients using our solution who have a control tower. So definitely there will be an alarm and the cargo department will take certain measurements. But if you can improve also um, this exchange um, by not only sending an alert that it is offloaded, just offloaded, if it gets to an equipment change, the flight ops department, which has an oversee of the whole network. I mean, a cargo system usually just have, has different schedules. Yeah, basically flight ops could take an active role and inform the cargo department. Hey, that's the other flight we've booked it on. And that's how it goes further. And what's also interesting when you look at real time interaction, I mean, cargo nowadays is not only flown by one carrier. We've got a lot of joint ventures and different carriers working with you with each other and we have IBS have developed for example a joint venture engine to basically also drive this it's not only the airline systems inside need to talk to each other I mean the network will also be affected taking for example we see a lot of um, shipments going into South America actually going via Miami and from Miami other carriers takes take this over Centurion Amerijet Copper which actually connected to um, the European carriers so you fly this into Miami and because of the offload or downsize of the equipment a disruption basically the connection flight won't be reached so also the other carrier needs to be informed hey you will receive this cargo much later something needs to happen there or even prepared or it could be the case that the, the minimum connecting time has reduced so there needs to be somebody on the turmoil when the flights coming in, come in, yeah, and needs to act accordingly. Or if a flight is delayed, even even the loading crew actually at at the origin um, can do um, uh, measurements. Like for example, um, the pallet which needs to go on another flight and the minimum minimum connecting time has been reduced can be loaded last on the aircraft. So it's the first pallet which is offloaded off the aircraft and then can be easily or very quickly moved to the, the connecting flight um, in the transit destination. So how how is flight ops making sure that the rebooking of freight if needed is taking place? How how are the needed handling measurements taking place on the commodities? 
better because of the batteries over time. An active cooling container needs battery recharges. So certain activities need to take place. And this is why um, developing real-time interaction and, and the exchange of data is really key. Making quality relevant, and Daniel just mentioned uh, Cargo 2000, it's called now Cargo IQ. And a lot of carriers, especially in the cargo departments, measure their overall performance actually against these KPIs. Yeah, flown as booked, unloaded, offload, build pallet, all of these things KPIs need to be met. And therefore actually ops or the OCC has can have a really impact if how, on these KPIs and how they are driven. So can the cargo department take an active approach to measurements needed with you to delivery? Flow on a spoke, no temperature breaches, equipment changes if needed, active cooling, etc. All of this needs to take place and it, it is affected by the decisions which are basically take, taken in your OCCs. So that's about making quality relevant taking an active approach and in the future actually with e-commerce, with perishables, with pharma, especially with the vaccine of COVID, all of this needs to be considered. So how does a cargo operation system looks like? And I, I wanted to emphasize this. This is basically how um, um, what the different function system, system has. And it shows basically how how um, how it's not interacting with the cargo uh, with the OCC basically. You've got EDI and messaging. So this is type B or EDI, customs or forwarders with CCSs and airlines. So then you have the core functionality where you do export operations, of course, import uh, operations, transfer and interline. You do station cash drawer, the warehouse management. And as Marcos already emphasized earlier in this call, you have UAD management. So all these key functions, export operations, import operations, transfer interline, UAD management um, are core functions, but they are affected by the decisions which are taken in the OCC and vice versa, of course. Um, station cash flow is another functionality, SLA management. Certain crown handlers have as a SLAs with you and any decision you take with your aircraft can affect this as SLA and this needs to be considered. Um, in a modern um, IT landscape, of course, interface services are seen too. We've got integrated weight scales, we've got accounting ERPs, we've got, we already spoke about sensors and material handling, all connected actually to the cargo system. And this is all done by via APIs. The interesting thing is, why isn't the connectivity to the different airline systems not done by EDI and depends on messaging? And this is what I wanted to emphasize. And also the accessibility. I mean, working remote, mobile devices are needed. This is all there. Scanners, PC screens. From a cargo system perspective, this is all there. But with you to an OCC and the interaction, that's where the bottleneck is. So I really ask the question to the audience now. Do you think EDI and messaging is sufficient to exchange the needed um, data for the race topics. What do you think, Markus, for example? Um, let's put it this way. I think it is a good starting point, and also, also probably one thing about EDI messaging. I think we we, we are very often, you know, taking it as an old system and, and an old standard that needs to be replaced. But let's be also very honest. It is a very reliable system that is running in the background of. Uh, quite a few dominant ERP systems. So the technology by itself is not bad. I think my main concern is really with specifically with cargo operations and cargo carriers and the forwarding industry is that everyone seems to wait for the next big thing, which will resolve all problems in one magic go, as if there is someone out there with a magic wand. This is not going to happen. EDI and messaging can only be a starting point, of course, because it provides the sufficient data exchange for, let's say, the core functionalities. If you want to go further, if you want to, you know, partner with the likes of an Alibaba or an Amazon in the future or whoever may come up in, in I don't know, 10 years time, you will require something else. You will require APIs. And that's where it becomes tricky that, you know, the cargo domain is a, is a silo domain. So what we see here, EDI and messaging is pretty much um, cargo operational driven. What we need to bear in mind is that we want to have systems that can talk to each other. And in order to do that, API is the thing of the future. We want to have really something that is referred to as web services, i.e. an architecture that we're all familiar with when using the Internet. 
and that is the way forward. So API is 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 from my point of view what we need in the future. It's an efficient and a fast way to exchange data. It's safe and secure on top of that. And I think that is also one other topic, um, Christian, that we need to to throw into the discussion. It has to do with the change of mindset that providing APIs is not necessarily secu- uh, increasing the the risk of your system being attacked from the outside. It it does one way, but it's still it's a safe way of doing it. And I recall a conversation I had with a large North American carrier about even creating an EDI connectivity connectivity. The manager in charge told me, Marcos, we will never allow that. We don't want anyone to have access directly to our system. So um, there's two things. We need to A, change the mindset. And the other thing, we always need to think IT security um, alongside that whole discussion and provide the confidence that whatever interface we're creating is safe and secure and will not lead to a system being meddled with by other parties. I absolutely Thank- absolutely on the line what you just have said i mean when when we build this interconnectivity w- between different systems and when, when you come from a cargo standpoint i mean just think in a scenario where a forwarder is connected via an api with the shipper the forwarder connects via an api actually to the cargo system and then the cargo system connects via an api into the occ system i mean just think about it um a guy sitting at the shipper, you have no control about, can use all of this connectivity to actually pay, perhaps even get access to aircraft. So absolutely, this is absolutely what we're saying, and it's paramount. And I think also that's also what we need to talk about, and we need to emphasize um, cybersecurity will play a major role in this future setup, actually. Yep. Somebody else wanted to say something. Sorry, I didn't get it. Daniel? Yeah, I think the, the, the key word was here, uh, new mindset. So I think cargo and passenger business have then something in common because in earlier virtual ops 2020 season sessions, we have also identified the new mindset is, is uh, the, the key for the required business transformation and, and the change management uh, instead of always seeing the risk. I think people need to see the opportunities and they are there. So I think the current crisis is exactly a big opportunity for cargo carriers and airlines to change um, the the course. So um, coming to my next slide, and um, I'm not an expert in this, and you all can correct me if I'm wrong, but I was looking at this and I was thinking about, okay, you've got this inner circle of an OCC. There's operations control, there's flight dispatch, there's crew control, and there's maintenance. And then you've got the second circle around this, which is considered, of course, revenue management. You've got a hub control center. You've got an AOG desk. You've got technical tropical shooting if anything happens with an aircraft. And there, of course, MRO comes into place for material planning, maintenance planning, maintenance scheduling, line maintenance, weight and balance even plays a major role. But why you only see cargo besides of ground ops, scheduling, crew planning, maintenance, network management, commercial planning in the outer circle. I think cargo should also play its role actually in the inner circle of an OCC. And how 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 does this exchange? If I basically take take two areas, yeah, all the information with is exchanged via a type B message about an equipment change or um, schedule changes. That's all basically um, what the cargo system gets from the OCC. And what what the OCC maybe get um, from the cargo system itself is a a freight forward message. And that's reality. I mean, this is what most carriers are set up currently. Like Daniel already said, our systems are built in a different way. We want to basically break this bottleneck and make more information exchange and the key of it marcos already said um this is another slide is basically apis yeah i think what is here also uh, mandatory is that the walls within the airline itself that they are dismantled because uh, speaking with airlines and and occ a business transformation i'm always hearing yeah the commercial department is not sharing um, the potential revenues uh, with that flight and then of course the, the revenue management information is not always considered uh, while decision making and that's why I think the cargo 
there needs to be also included more in the revenue management side and then also these information being used um, in the inner circle for decision making. I think that's also key for a holistic approach in decision making. So, um, I mean, we are talking, we, we talked a lot about how, how it is currently and, and what needs to happen in the future. So we are not there yet and we need to design a vision to build a bridge between cargo and ops. And to develop, I think, to develop this vision or to develop the solution as it needs to be, we need to, um, we need to um, involve all three distinct stakeholder perspectives. And we already said this, um, if you want to work with the e-commerce world, and this is basically the, the customer view, you know, you need to understand how they are doing bis businesses and you need to understand what are they expecting, actually. What do they want to see? What information do they want to see? What services you need to deliver? Then, of course, on top of it is all we are all carriers. We all want to um, earn money. So we need to develop an enterprise view. How, how does the business achieve better performance metrics? How can we reduce costs, increase our revenues? And this is the overall mindset change. How can we generate new ways of business? And then, of course, the last but not least, we are all in this together. We have people out there working for you. You guys in the OCCs, the people in the cargo departments, etc. So there needs to be also the user view, which represents basically what the core system needs to achieve, how this state we, we've talked about data exchange API, but what we also need to think about what actually happens with the data. How is this correlated? How is this being used? How is this visualized actually to drive actually the, the respective needed correct decision making within the different departments? And what we also should emphasize, how can this boost actually the per, per, um, personal performance of us all? So when we talk about a solution, when we generate the vision, what needs to be achieved, getting rid of these silos, these different views should be actually paramount to be considered. And last but not least, and that's how I will end my today's discussion or my today's deck. I see it, the only solution basically for all of this, perhaps the holy grail is APIs. So that was everything from my side. And so I open the room now for a general discussion on all of these topics. Thank you, Christian. I, I think that was a great presentation and uh, it was so much information. Um, and yeah, I would also now open up um, the question and answer. So is there any, any question coming from Taipei maybe at the moment? Maybe you can stop uh, your screen sharing, Chris. Already did. Okay. Yeah. Well, we okay. can, can you share the slide for us to study? Yes, we can do that. So Thank we are you. going to, uh, we, we, we will share with you the slides and also um, the entire recording that you can go through it again. Uh, it was a lot of information, of course, and we know it's uh, sometimes heavy to digest, um, but uh, we are happy to also continue um, conversation with you. If you have any questions, post this event, just get in touch with us. Okay, Thank sir. you. Thank you. So I have a question. Uh, how about this thing the, about the one raker? Now the IATA have to develop the one raker, and I think in the future, maybe they have the, for the CCS, they maybe will integrate, have the platform, and then to uh, install the one raker format and to uh, request all the partner to upload the data, for example, for the for water, for the shipper, for the custom, or for the airline, every party to upload the data into the this platform and then they can download if depend on they need. Of course they need to pay the money. How about you think this program? How how about you think in the future, how to develop this this platform? This is my question. Perhaps Marcus, you can comment on that because you managed one one um, a cargo community platform like Traxon, and how how would you perceive um, that in the context <laughs> what they just asked, Marcus? Yeah, I, I think it's a bit of a challenge because I think what we see is a very is a tremendous effort by the by the industry really to create something like a common standard that tries to to basically cover all aspects of the air cargo supply chain and all documentation. 
And I think that's where also its flaws are. I think that is where we will just have to acknowledge we operate in a very complex environment. Each country is different. Each commercial entity, be it the European Union, be it NAFTA areas, whatever, have their own um, customs jurisdiction, et cetera, and so on and, and forward. Then you have, I don't know, countries in China where, you know, authorities may require different um, information in order to proceed with um, a cargo shipment. So hence, I think it's a good effort. I don't think what we will see is sort of like a global implementation at the same time, at the same scale. That is not going to happen from my point of view. Um, what we will see, there will be trade lanes where it will become a standard between partners, where you can think about carriers, airport relations, what we have seen already um, with the various airports, let's say, and what we've seen with um, Amsterdam, for example, and Atlanta building a data corridor. So that is happening. Um, what for the foreseeable future is not going to go away from my point of view is the role of the cargo community um, platforms, be it the likes of a Traxxon or the likes of a Decard or CCN Singapore, Gilles Hong Kong, you can name them all, the variety of them. Um, their death had been predicted many times. And I think that was actually when I started at Traxxon as a managing director, I was welcomed with the words by a large European carrier said, Marcus, wrong timing, the CCS are dead. And um, what we have seen over the past six years is that the data exchanged by these platforms has increased tremendously. And as I just said, when you talk to people that are used to EDI data exchange in ERP system, be in banking or other industries, it is a reliable functioning technology sufficient for what we're doing. So let's not try to reinvent the wheel. It's a good effort by IATA, so I'm not, not, not uh, saying it's, it's, it shouldn't be done. But let's also be realistic. Let's focus on the things that we can do now. And then when we're ready, let's do the next step to the next technology. And as I said earlier to, to Christian's question, I think the, the, the key to everything is that we think in mind about possible collaborations, partnerships. And I'll give you one practical example and then I'll stop. Um, when I was working for a large European carrier that had set up a, a joint venture, it's something alongside the Star Alliance type of things where you wanted to share and book across different carriers. And what we saw there at the time is that, you know, when you wanted to book on a joint venture partner, the station actually needed to send a fax to the headquarter of the cargo control center of that carrier in <laughs> order to receive a confirmation for a booking that was supposed to be going, let's say, I don't know, from Northern Europe somewhere to the Southern Pacific arena. So when you think about it nowadays, you know, that needs to be done via integrated technology. So you need to be able to book into a partner system rather than sending a fax or making a phone call or sending an email. Hence, EDI will play a role. APIs will play a larger role in the future. And the, the data exchange should be a mindset where you always think along, how can I partner with that technology? I want to add something to, to your question on what Mark has said. One record is, of course, one way of doing it, and it's a great initiative. But in the meantime, a lot of effort can be done in a different way. And um, we at IBS believe that ABI is APIs are actually a key to it. So we've built a sales platform, which we, we call it sales platform. We call it the API gateway. And you talk just about one record is all about data exchange, having one source of data uploaded in the data backbone, and then every different party can pull the data. We truly believe... <laughs> The two main players are actually the forwarders and, and, and you, the carrier. So with the sales platform, we're connecting actually our system, iCargo, directly to the systems of forwarder system providers like Vicetech, Riege, for example, CargoSoft via an API gateway. So basically the, 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 the shipment related data you need to have to do your business, to send the data to customs will actually come via APIs directly out of the forwarder system. And we are all also um, we are already implementing this, and you will see or we'll hear more about that also during our iCargo forum, where NCA will basically one of our cargo carriers will elaborate about how we we built this for for them together with DHL. But the intention of us is actually to build a whole via the sales platform a whole digital landscape to connect to these different systems. Cargo distribution platforms like Web Cargo, and we had Camillo on the call who basically um, um, they are driving this. We also built an API connect connectivity to, to them. Or you might have heard of this new emerging platform called Cargo.one. We also connect. That's all basically booking or amiable related data that is being exchanged. So similar to what one record is. 
But again, it's the eyes, basically. Michael, you mentioned earlier you have a list of questions. Do you want to ask one of them before we are closing the session? Okay, just hang on. My colleague Derek will uh, ask. Good morning to you all. Derek, what's your question, please? I'd like to know how does this uh, benefit uh, startup like ours because the system seems to rely on uh, historical data and uh, we are very new players in uh, this field of cargo. What, what's the benefit for us? Yeah, I think first of all, you always benefit from the experience of IBS software and all the uh, other customers who are working with us and we would always give you a recommendation. So, um, of course, you you have some um, um, indications uh, from the industry and uh, also working with you, we would look into your processes and uh, what are your business policies and then give you some uh, basic recommendations which you can uh, start to work on from day one on. Um, sometimes you can also get uh, data from third party sources, which can be also used for decision making. So that's how we are somehow trying to help airlines if they are starting uh, from scratch. Uh, and then uh, secondly, how secure is this information? Because once you, uh, let's say, deploy the system, it's accessing different aspects of the organization. Um, What's the guarantee that all this information is going to be stored safely and is in the right hands and nobody can you know, compromise it? Well, we have, of course, here in, in Europe, the GDPR topic since uh, some years and uh, IBS uh, is totally in line with that. Where we've made several projects where GDPR, uh, so the data privacy laws had to be uh, met uh, with 100% security. So we have the experience to do that. And of course, we have the rise uh, security mechanism in the IT infrastructure we are also making use. Um, and that's something where our long uh, last experience is then also helping startup carriers to not reinvent the wheel and just following industry's best practice. We are also, what I would add to the iCargo solution is hosted out of four data centers actually around the globe where we basically take the measurements and we have the respective security certification. So you can also assess that, of course. But you could also, um, what we also do for a few clients, we host iCargo also out of the AWS cloud. And of course, AWS has respective security measurements and you can read them. So that's how your data will, bas will be basically um, secured. Uh, so we come question. to the end of the session. Ah, okay, so the last question. Just one yeah, more. Um, yeah. you, uh, earlier, I think in your introduction, you were talking about this system being able to access, uh, especially the passenger system, and letting and passing on information so that you can determine how much you're carrying or not. Uh, just, just if you can, in a few minutes, clarify that for me. Where the first um, we get the LDM message, which is a Type B e message. We are getting the PTM, the PNL message, uh, and, and all these uh, message are carrying exactly you know, the origin destination uh, information of, of the passenger. And then uh, we can also get from revenue management system, of course, commercial information. And by um, getting all this consolidated in one database, we are then providing a specific view for all passenger related information that you can exactly take the best decision based on the value of a passenger uh, in which uh, booking a class he is flying and whether he has to catch an ongoing uh, connecting flight somewhere at another destination. All right, thank you. That's all for now. So thank you very much uh, for a wonderful uh, Virtual Ops 2020 season uh, cargo related session, Christian. Uh, Marcos, Derek, uh, Michael and all the others, thank you very much for all your comments and uh, very good questions. Um, the good news is, um, besides the fact that this session is over, that we are going to continue this week with the Virtual Ops 2020 season and also uh, at the end of September. So we have uh, more interesting sessions scheduled. If you want to be part um, of another Virtual Ops 2020 season session in uh, September, just register for it. Some of you did already, 
Uh, and we are also planning to continue with this very specific uh, concept and format, uh, which is different in a one-way webinar. Uh, you see all questions are answered. Um, and we want to foster really the brain uh, pool uh, and also the spread of the brain pool uh, in, across all industries. And uh, uh, I wish you a great uh, rest of the day or maybe end of the day. And uh, for me, it's very important to be healthy and safe and looking forward to have you soon with us again. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Thank you, Daniel, Christian, Marcus. Bye bye. Bye bye. 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 Mm. 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 Mm.